Bonsoir à tous. Merci d'être avec nous. Euh, je m'appelle hey everybody, thank you for being here. My name is Carolina Boussada. I am the chief editor of Forum. And I have the great pleasure to welcome Anne Poiré, who created this, this uh, fantastic film. I'm very happy to have her today. Hello, Anne. Let's sit down. Thank you. Mondial pour ce film, il a été filmé quoi il y a trois jours, jours. Alors, ça fait quoi de le voir la première fois sur grand écran avec toute cette audience on est, non, en tout cas, nous, on est vraiment très contents. C'était important pour nous de... Such a film is a team. You have people supporting us. You have also TV channel supporting us, RT, uh, the Swiss uh, radio, uh, television, Gaspar Alami, Barbara Conforti. It's a whole team. You have a cameraman, Thibaut de Lavigne, whose family is here, who shoot these beautiful pictures. And then you have a whole uh, team. I wanted to thank. Uh, I'm working on post-conflict situation uh, for about 15 years because it's very interesting to watch what is happening after a, a, a war. Of, uh, during the conflict, you get a lot of pictures, and afterwards, it's completely forgotten. And that's why I'm interested in going and watching what is happening several years afterwards. Uh, uh, Mosul was uh, one of the mo uh, most violent fight uh, and uh, urban uh, war since World War II. And uh, it seems to me very important to go and take contact with people who, at the back of the front lines, were thinking about what will be done to reconstruct this city, the city which has been at the hand of, the, of ISIS for three years. So so we're trying to find people uh, to, 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 and to follow them during a year. And that's why we found Dr. Yahayat, and we could see his flight during this year. But further, I wanted to, sh to show how a state rebuilds the whole fabric, social fabric. Uh, and the UN last year estimated that in the Southeast there were about 10 million of tons of rubble. Uh, 40,000 houses which have been destroyed. It's just can't imagine that. And I wanted also to show the population of the Sunnis, and uh, we didn't hear them during the ISIS years because they were cut off the rest of the world. They had no contact with the rest of the world. And something which is often forgotten, uh, the years of uh, ISIS were uh, quite uh, the result of a long degradation which has started also under Hussein. And it started in 2003, actually. It was too dangerous. The American army was involved. You have uh, uh, abductions, and uh, it was a terrible time for uh, the people. Many people say it was worse. Uh, many said that during the ISIS uh, occupation, there were rules, and they would more or less not. Dr. Hyatt uh, had been targeted uh, in the hospital in 2007. He was uh, at the head of this hospital. He was three months in coma, and uh, it's quite a miracle that he survived, like many uh, inhabitants of Mosul. Uh, you have a lot of uh, people in this film. Two were, are pretty amazing. The little girl holding the hand of her father every time she's on the screen. Where does she come? Masara, we didn't choose her. She chose, she has chosen us. We attended a, a meeting of uh, uh, cop shopkeepers who tried to, 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 to give, to revive a bit the souks and trying with 
without help of the states or any, any, without any municipal services, they tried to reopen their shops. You ha had to take away, to clear away the rubble. You had to organize a parking. You had to organize also buses to bring clients. And they tried to discuss about that. And you, you had this little girl because you'd seen them because he was a little princess. She is quite uh, amazing. And she came out of this crowd of men, came to us, and she opened her, her backpack, and she took out some plastic bags, and she offered us sweets. So we started to ask her questions, and uh, we, they were happy. They had been, they fled to the east, and the, uh, the, the, the close family hasn't been hit. The parents are alive. Uh, the house was shot, but her cousin, has been killed uh, under ISIS, and the whole family of his father uh, were killed in a shelling in Maidan, as you could hear. And by taking out the bodies, the father had a, 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 a cerebral attack, and he was he, and uh, the, the little girl helps him because he is uh, disabled on one side of his uh, body. So it was important to have this father because this is something which gives hope uh, in Mosul. They, those people who, without help, with all the governance problems they meet and with all the instability, uh, 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 have this resilience. They want to bring life back in the city. They want that Mosul remains there. The other person in the film, figure in the film, is also the lady who is a, 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 a woman, the wife of uh, ISIS leader, and she is. Uh, she regrets uh, the ISIS time. How could you manage to, to get to her? The, the, the people who help us to find the, the, the figures of the film are fixers or journalists. They are kind of facilitators. And he had had a contact with this woman when they reopened Maidan because she wanted to uh, retrieve the bodies of her uh, sons, two were Emir in Maidan, and one is in prison, one who doesn't know where. And she wanted to, to retrieve the bodies because she, she was very vocal about that. Even if she dashed, if she had no certificate, she wanted the bodies, the corpse of her uh, sons. And she accepted to uh, talk to us uh, uh, with the condition that we would hide her face. And uh, she explains very clearly why before Dash, uh, ISIS, uh, she was living outside of Mosul in a very poor neighborhood. There are no pub public service. There is no rent. When the children were ill, for instance, you couldn't send the children to the hospital in Mosul because you had checkpoints uh, held by Shias and uh, they couldn't go through. So she explains her uh, adhesion to, 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 uh, to uh, ISIS is that this. It's kind of revenge and fanatism, but then remains only revenge. Many families are in the camps, but you have refugee camps outside of uh, Mosul. They cannot go out, and they don't know how to come back. And these are time bombs. But also inside of Mosul, you have lots of family who are like ghosts. They uh, are entitled to nothing. But now, because of corruption, they can more or less uh, uh, get out. Uh, but, uh, for us, it was important to give her a voice, too. So you've been uh, following all of that during 2017 and 18, and then you came back again more recently. How do you think things are now evolving? Until uh, last November, uh, the inhabitants well, maybe you understood that things are very different in the East and the West. In the East, life is uh, back. And these people, for months and months, uh, were very happy because there was peace around. Uh, there were no uh, attacks, uh, no assassinations. So they had, finally, peace that they had not enjoyed since uh, 2003. Now, the situation, of course, is not uh, improving, although they, had, they were full of hopes. 
Attacks uh, have happened again in Mosul. There was one last November, another one uh, uh, 10 days ago, and another one last Friday. IS has not claimed uh, these uh, attacks, and people uh, think that maybe it's not them. And indeed, uh, that's the most worrying at the moment. I had a chat this morning with uh, our fixers. As long as there are no executions, no kidnappings, and people are not killed, there's still hope. The governor, whom you saw in the film, has organized apparently a parliamentary mission, an inquiry commission. And I don't know exactly what happened, but maybe he might be um, destituted today. I don't know. So the situation is very unstable. I still believe that it's very important to build bridges with Mosul. People don't really know what was life in uh, Mosul and what may explain why Daesh managed to get to Mosul. Between 2003 and 2014, the situation, as I explained, was also very tired. Thank you very much, Anne. I'll turn to you in the public. Maybe you want to ask one or two questions before we go to the panel. There are people going around with uh, microphones if you want to ask a question on the film. And then we'll uh, welcome our panelist and the moderator. Raise your hands if you want to ask a question. Good evening. I have two questions, in fact. The film seems to suggest that the, the central government, the Iraqi central government, doesn't do much uh, regarding rebuilding Mosul. Is that true? Is there uh, any will to do anything or not? And then my second question is UNESCO. I believe they have a rebuilding plan that is probably the biggest ever organized by UNESCO. Um, what are the difficulties in acting on the ground? We see one or two images, uh, and we see UNESCO officials, but they of course, uh, arrived after everything has been destroyed in the old town. What can the UN and UNESCO do in that kind of context? I suggest we take two or three questions together. Any other questions on the film? Because uh, coming back to the issue of the central government and Mosul, I think we'll probably come back to it during the discussion. Good evening. Did you feel how things were blocked by corruption? Is that, according to you, the main issue, the main problem? Because you don't really know whom you can trust. And probably the wrong people are being chosen. On the issue of the uh, government, uh, the inaction by the Iraqi government is considered 
uh, by local people uh, as a revenge by the uh, central government on Sunnis. They believe that if Baghdad does not do anything because they want to crush them, to punish them for letting Daesh into Mosul. What is happening is that uh, first uh, the government relied on the international community, at least that's what I explained to me. So they were relying on the international community because they didn't have themselves more money. They couldn't do more for Mosul. Things have slightly changed. And I believe that between the international community and uh, the Baghdad government, um, they're sort of playing games uh, as to who will be uh, doing something. The real issue is how you organize things on the ground once you get the funding. And then the political issues coming. There's a huge political problem in Mosul. And this was a big problem for the international community. They have largely underestimated the problem with the governor. They gradually realized that they could not do anything without him, and everything they st tried to set up without him they couldn't do. It just didn't happen. He wouldn't sign papers off. Nothing was happening. And nobody uh, was daring uh, to go around the governor. And uh, in December, uh, the governor actually somehow threatened uh, the international community. And uh, they started stopping to talk to Hayat. They didn't open local offices, and so on and so forth. Indeed, UNESCO has uh, developed a rebuilding plan. And you do see in the film how very little they seem to be able to do. Even though there is some funds uh, from the Emirates, they had funds even before the uh, Daesh uh, rifle. But now, they're not even able to start demining, mine clearing. They had not, in December, even yet chosen the agency who would be in charge of uh, mine clearance. There are political issues, of course, uh, with local uh, actors and Basically, things are moving me extremely slowly for the people. And corruption, of course, I think it's pretty obvious you could feel it. This documentary is not an inquiry in itself. Giovanni, uh, the guy from UNESCO, told us, he said, I'm Italian, you're French, you know very well what happens with the big uh, uh, estate projects. So there's lots of money involved with complicated processes and this attracts uh, corrupt people. And then there's rampant uh, corruption. You need to pay if you want to get any kind of document, official papers. And this is extremely worrying because uh, this allows Daesh people to get out, others get arrested. But this is rampant in uh, society. This is not new. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. Thank you very much. I think we will now uh, leave the floor to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me ask the panelists and the moderator to come up on the stage. We're going to talk about uh, rebuilding. First of all, 
les conséquences et notamment de Donatella Corvena from uh, Amnesty International. She's been investigating uh, about rebuilding Iraq and Syria. Mustafa Sardoun will be speaking uh, uh, in Arabic, and the rest of the discussion will be happening in English. Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce the panel, um, composed of uh, Maha, Dr. Maha Sabkan, um, on my left, a pediatrician at the hospital in Diwaniya, and head of the um, Human Rights Advisory Board in Iraq. And on my right, uh, Mustafa Sadun, who's a journalist at Al Monitor and the director of the Iraqi Observatory for Human Rights, and uh, last but not least, um, on my left, Francesco Motta, who is representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, in charge of Asia, Asia Pacific and the Middle East, but more importantly, who spent seven years, eight years in Iraq um, and so, um, welcome to, um, to you all. Um, I want to start with a few um, brief remarks, because I think it's way more interesting to, to hear from, from our guests. But some of the issues that came to mind as I watched the film, uh, and having worked um, in Iraq um, over many years before, um, the war, after the war, um, in places like Mosul, um, before ISIS took over, during and after, um, what would any of us do uh, confronted with what we've seen? Um, how much space is there for, um, for the individual in the face of so much mass destruction? Um, for for individual pain, for individual grievances, for individual aspirations. Um, and I think one of the things that came out strongly in the film, and that has also been uh, my experience um, in Mosul and elsewhere, I've, I've just come back from uh, another trip to Raqqa um, investigating um, coalition strikes and the destruction there. Um, which is very similar to, um, to Mosul. It's the resilience of ordinary people who find the strength to pick up the pieces, um, not because they are getting help, but in spite of the fact that they're not getting help and that they are facing so many obstacles for the simplest things, uh, not long ago, I got back in touch with a family in East Mosul. Um, several members of the families, including a three-year-old girl and the five-year-old boys, were killed in a, in a bombardment by the coalition in the battle for Mosul. And 18 months later, the family was still trying to obtain a certificate that says that the three-year-old girl is not a terrorist. Um, they need various papers to be able to put together a dossier to then put forward to the governorate in the hope of getting perhaps some financial help because their house was destroyed and several members of the family were killed. Um, so they, they were able to get that paper for everybody else, including the five-year-old boy, but they had not been able to get the paper that said that the three-year-old girl is not a terrorist. 
So with people facing so many difficulties, how do they, how can they, how do they go forward? And how do they go forward in the face of so many issues that are, that, that have sort of been the thread um, that has gone, sort of that has, that has carried through from conflict to conflict, you know, at least over the past 15 years or so, uh, since 2003, for example, in Iraq. Um, sectarian conflicts, we've seen some of that manifested in, in Mosul, the flags, the different groups, um, remarks that were made by uh, residents of Mosul, uh, but also by, by the UN official who was speaking there. And, and, and I think it'll be good to, to, to develop this with, um, with some of our, uh, our, our panelists, whether is, is, is sectarianism a driver of the conflict or is the conflict contributing and, and heightening and developing sectarianism and, and you know, the place of revenge uh, and, and the extent to which revenge and the desire for revenge shapes what will happen next. Um, the film, of course, is about Mosul, and Mosul has seen, I guess, the worst in, in Iraq in recent years um, in terms of the, um, the length under, that Mosul spent under the control of ISIS um, in terms of... <coughs> what happened in Mosul for so many years, which, uh, excuse me, um, which may have contributed to the rise of ISIS. But also let's not forget that there are the same problems that we've seen highlighted in Mosul are present in other parts of Iraq, Ambar, Diyala, Salahaddin, but also places where um, where the issue isn't ISIS, places like Basra, where it's not ISIS, but it's drugs and corruption. You know, the, Basra is the most oil-rich city in, um, in Iraq, and the condition um, of life are miserable. Um, and then corruption, which again we've seen uh, highlighted in the film and how that's going to shape what happens next in Mosul and, and the rest of Iraq. Um, and then the role of the international community. Isn't it striking that there is always money and resources, human and material, for war, but then there aren't the necessary resources for addressing uh, and redressing the consequences of war or for preventing the next war. Um, and I'll, I'll um, stop there and, um, and, and open the floor. Perhaps, um, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll get Maha's impression, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. Um, Really, she mentioned something about the child who was trying to get a proof that she did not belong to ISIS to get a death certificate. Same thing is done in the central and south. Uh, below 15 years old, that means they were born after 2003, and they, they sent them to get certificate that they did not belong to, they were not leaders in Ba'ath Party. So the same problem, it is faced all over. Regarding extremism, extremism is one and the same, whether it is ISIS or other Islamist uh, extremes, like um, they are practicing violence, whether in the south or in the north, but names have got different, uh, they got different names, but the practice is that just one and the same. So what you have seen in Basra, it is, uh, if you don't want to call it extremism, it is extremism. If you want to call it Daesh-like, so it is Daesh-like. It is one and the same, that 
the act is the same, the names are changing. And uh, you mentioned something about uh, what happened in Mosul. What happened in Mosul was very terrible. And uh, it started before Daesh, before 2014, when there was a conflict in uh, Ninawa uh, between uh, Shia Shabak and Christians. And which we, as a, a network for uh, facilitators network, we intervened to solve the issue. And uh, regarding Mosul, when it was handed over to Daesh, investigation, central inv investigation was uh, to be, uh, was done. And till today, uh, the results are not announced and not declared because the culprits <laughs> are known and uh, they don't want to disclose it. So we expect that when the regime is changed and uh, Iraq will come back to, uh, on the road of health, to get back health, to health and to develop again, it's when uh, no more uh, uh, sectarianism, no more uh, uh, different parties they want uh, according, no more um, they will not be able to the and the 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 film Maybe all these uh, issues could have been solved. The film is, uh, is really good, but I have not seen, for example, any um, meeting between uh, the Shabak and the Yazidi. I have not uh, seen any uh, meeting with the Shia militia so that you could see all the different uh, viewpoints from all uh, stakeholders. So that you could uh, indeed uh, see all viewpoints. As to the woman in the film, uh, Daesh uh, brought us back to the Middle Ages. And the international community is also to blame for that because Daesh is a multinational organization with people coming from all over the ground. Americans and the high percentage of them. And will job of car hatama kabl al Asur al Wusta. There were many violations of international uh, treaties and conventions, and unfortunately, the international uh, community just uh, sat back watching. Fight Daesh and kick them out. The troops. Coalition troops did not allow them. Thank you. Your reaction? Okay. <laughs> الموصل قبل وبعد الحرب سنجد انه اسباب سقوط We were talking about Mosul before and after the war when the city fell We also we have also talked about what happened under Daesh but uh, Daesh also committed many human rights violations. The security forces were in control of everything. After Daesh, then the same thing happened. Security forces dominate in Mosul. And they're not welcomed by citizens. 
many tribal leaders are not satisfied with this situation. The United States and the media, Iraqi media, unfortunately, did not do anything. They don't, did not play a, a positive part. People thought that the situation would be back to normal, but to this day, it is not the case. Some uh, 750,000 people are still living in tents and in camps. And on the whole, uh, there are 30,000 uh, disappeared. Many of the disappeared uh, there are government institutions that send uh, false uh, news around even uh, towards the international community. Many things are being said in Mosul and about Mosul, and this just goes to show that people uh, cannot uh, live a proper life. They do not get any support. There are some uh, 30 or 40,000 houses that have been destroyed, and that would need to be rebuilt. But all the projects are completely artificial and will not allow for rebuilding uh, people uh, in Iraq. The conflict has just uh, uh, become a different kind of conflict. It's uh, more of an economic nature. There's all, uh, also the issue of uh, demographics in Mosul. There is uh, an influence by Iran, and that's increasing. There are armed groups in Mosul that come from Iran, and this is all uh, very worrying. On the economic side, uh, the situation is also very difficult. Cooperation uh, with uh, people in charge is totally improvised. There are no properly designed projects, no long-term vision. Medical health centers, uh, the hospital that had uh, 800 beds or only uh, has 150 beds or so today. The other one, which had uh, some 300 beds, uh, also has uh, very few today. And children are not properly cared for. There's no drugs and medicine to treat people. Lots of people have been amputated during the war. There are no prosthetics uh, that are available for people. Those who were amputated and got treatment and received uh, prosthetic uh, treatment are still suffering uh, from uh, traumatic uh, disorders. They have seen uh, horrendous things, people being de decapitated. They have witnessed uh, war action. There are very few uh, centers to uh, treat uh, people and to offer psychological care. 
التلاميذ ممكن يتواجدون في في المدرسه الوضع في الموصل ماساوي بشكل كبير جدا there's one school which was able to cater for 200 pupils and that now caters for 400 so there are many problems privilege of uh, chairing the panel to ask a specific question to, to Francesco, which is the uh, presence of the international community has been strong in Iraq for a good number of years. And uh, um, we're the Human Rights uh, Film Festival, and so let's just look at the human rights um, side of things. Today, uh, we are at the end of the war against ISIS, the territorial war against ISIS, then the other war, it's another story. Um, in a small town in Syria, um, a very, like, sort of one square kilometer remains under the control of ISIS, and, uh, and we are seeing uh, some of the Yazidi captives, uh, members of the Yazidi minority um, who were abducted by ISIS four and a half years ago, um, who are coming out of that small um, territory that remains under ISIS control. Um, thousands of them are still missing. One thing which is absolutely shocking is that four and a half years later, not one person in Iraq has been brought to justice and convicted for having abducted, killed, raped, otherwise tortured, enslaved thousands of women and children, mostly from the uh, Yazidi minority, but also some Christians, some Shia, from, some from other uh, minorities. How can it be that um, our tax money, because the European countries have put a lot of money into training the Iraqi judiciary, has given such abysmally poor results and more to the point what, what, what should be done to end up with a different result? Okay. Um, is this working? Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with a story. And this is at the time in, back in 2014. I arrived in Iraq in the beginning of 2010, and I left Iraq in May 2017. And I, in fact, last visited Mosul when, in fact, a third of the city was still under the control of the Daesh and there was still considerable fighting and destruction going on in the city. But back in 2014, I had, I think, one of the worst weeks of my life, which was in August, precisely, when the Daesh actually seized large areas um, of Sinjar and northern Iraq. Um, the thing about the Daesh was that they would rape a woman, but they wouldn't search her. They wouldn't touch a woman unless they were committing some act of sexual violence on her. And as a result, a lot of the women who were captured, particularly Yazidi women, still had their telephones with them. Um, and because we'd been working in so many areas of Iraq, we had contacts, th contacts throughout the country. And one of the things I want to uh, reiterate to you was... My team and I, after the collapse of the Iraqi government in 2014, and it was a literal collapse of the government, the only institution that was still able to gather information across the country about what was happening in the streets of Mosul was basically the United Nations um, uh, Human Rights Office because we still had those contacts and those people were still phoning us. So we had doctors from the hospital and former school teachers and judges and NGO workers calling us on a daily basis to tell us. Now, what happened was... After large areas of Sinjar fell, I got a disturbing telephone call from a woman who was a Yaz uh, Yazidi from the village of Kocho, and she had been seized by the Daesh, um, and she still had her telephone. And she called me and she said, they've just raped my children in front of me, and when they bring them back, I'm going to kill them and myself unless someone comes to rescue us. What do you say to someone who's just told you that they're pleading for their lives, but they're going to kill themselves and their children to save themselves from the indignity of what's happening to them. And there's nothing you can do, nothing you can do to help them. And the tragedy of Iraq is that all of this need not have happened. It need not have happened. 
People often say that uh, the war in Iraq started in June 2014. It didn't start in June 2014. It started decades before. And it started with decades of really vile human rights abuses and violations committed by various governments over decades. It culminated in the forced removal of the regime of Saddam Hussein, by which time, you know, more than a million Iraqis had been killed and a million Iraqis had disappeared. In the aftermath of that regime, instead of bringing democracy and human rights and in institutions and restoring Iraq, Iraq immediately deteriorated back into series of conflict. And part of it was the fact that all those decades of human rights violations had made every community in Iraq feel that, like they were the victims of every other. And the international intervention in Iraq in 2003 merely ripped the lid off a pressure cooker. Um, and everyone was surprised that the country immediately descended or degenerated into violence and destruction. I don't know whether you, many of you remember the violence and destruction in Iraq in 2006, 2007. And I remember that the Office of Human Rights stopped counting bodies when it got to 30,000, and that was in March of 2017. And we have no idea how many people died in Iraq during that period of time. And why I say that all of this was preventable was because the international community had an opportunity to work with the people of Iraq to really address the root causes of that conflict, of conflicts in Iraq, and to deal with the sense of victimization that every community felt against each other. But we didn't take that course. And as a result, the governments that came into Iraq in successive years saw it as their job and obligation to commit acts of vengeance against other communities that they felt had treated them badly or committed violations against them in the past, and so on and so forth. And if we look at what are the root causes of the Daesh, because the Daesh just didn't come out of nowhere, they just didn't appear overnight, was the lack of denial of security, the lack of access to basic justice, violence against women and children, discrimination against minority groups and, and, and religious groups, lack of access or fair equitable access to basic services. If you go down to Basra today, a city which earns a million dollars in oil revenue every 20 minutes, they still don't have a clean water supply and they don't have a garbage collection service. You go to Tikar, a third of the province of Tikar has no clean water. Baghdad, the capital, still has no electricity. 13 years after the American intervention in 2003, and there's been no attempt at an inclusive political dialogue in the country. And in terms of the justice institutions, which I think is a really apt point, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Iraqi state in 2014, uh, an, Ameri an official came to me from the American Embassy and said, you know, I just don't understand it. We spent seven and a half billion dollars on the justice system in Iraq, and it all seems to have just blown into dust. Well, I'll tell you the reason why it just blew into dust. The reason was is because the international community spent a hell of a lot of money in Iraq addressing symptoms, not root causes. And the root causes were never addressed. Those underlying issues that I mentioned before, I only mentioned some of them, but those underlying root causes were never addressed and they never went away. And the issue for me now is that Iraq has a golden opportunity with the help of the international community to address those root causes. But if it doesn't, I'm telling you now, it will happen again. It will happen again. And next time, I don't think Iraq will recover. That, that's the diagnosis. The question really is, what can we do about it? Um, each and every one of us, uh, we are in one of the countries that, uh, that contributed to those, uh, in some part, to those seven and a half billion dollars that were wasted in the justice system with no results whatsoever. So what can we do uh, as citizens of the world to put pressure on our um, democratically elected government to spend our tax money in a different way, whether it's in Iraq or elsewhere, I mean, we're talking about Iraq now, so that we don't get the same result. Um, and I, I mean, I wanna raise a couple of points here. Um, um, that are um, specifically, I think, uh, within the field of competence of, of Mustafa and Francesco, and, and another point which is specifically um, more within the field of competence of, um, of um, Maha. Uh, and, and 
on the issue of uh, the justice system, for example, um, an awful lot of funds were spent on training and capacity building. Um, and, and I mean, that's what I've observed over um, years of, uh, of following Iraq. But with everything else, if, if we then do not follow up and really make sure that those skills that were supposedly acquired by those who benefited uh, from all those conferences and training that are then implemented in the courtroom. If, uh, if, if and, and when I say we, I mean um, all our countries have embassies in Iraq uh, there should be a representative of every embassies in the courtrooms in Baghdad and elsewhere in Iraq every day um, to see how trials are happening. I mean, trials in Iraq are an absolute sham, a, a disgrace and a scandal, um, but they are so because there is no monitoring, really, uh, apart from very, very rare exceptions. Um, I have not seen, um, as I said, apart from very rare exception, uh, reports of um, serious monitoring of how the courts work. Uh, and so I see no indication as of today that the international community um, is really doing things any differently today. Uh, really, um, and, and I don't know whether Maha and Mustafa who are living and working in Iraq every single day are seeing any, any difference. Um, and the other question that I had specifically for Maha is with regard to the health sector, um, Mosul or all the other places um, in Iraq, just Recently, in the last couple of weeks, we saw reports from w WHO, the World Health Organization, shining the spotlight on the fact that already Iraq has a quite a low presence of doctors per capita in, in comparatively to other countries, but how many doctors are fleeing Iraq because uh, of the attacks that they get subjected to amongst other things, apart from corruption and lack of resources in the hospital and feeling that they cannot do their job because they are not given the, the, the tools to do their job, but in addition, they also then get attacked. And, uh, and you know, what, what can be done differently? And, and on that, I wanted to pick up on a point that Maha mentioned on uh, a lot of the ISIS fighters were foreigners. A good, I mean, there was a percentage, but the reality is that both in Syria and Iraq, the overwhelming majority of the ISIS members were local. Yes, you had people from Europe and from well beyond Europe, from all over the world, really, but, um, but they were only a part of the problem, and uh, and 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 the question is, what can be done to to um, to prevent the same vicious cycle to repeat itself? Thank you very much. Regarding your last point, I think it is very difficult to revert uh, to revert it right now, because children are encouraged, they are given power to hold the weapon and authority. Uh, and they have enjoyed that sense. It's very difficult to return them to enjoy their childhood and live normal life because that, that is more attractive to them. And if we need, if we want really to revert it, we need uh, to work hard and it has not to be only Iraqi government that will work. Uh, regarding health sector, health sector is uh, very bad. We have no drugs, 
and the Minister uh, of Health came lately and said the drugs, we have a shortage of drugs in Iraq, especially life-saving drugs. And 75% of drugs in the markets, in the private sectors, are fake drugs. In the government sector, we have sh shortage, not for the chronic diseases, not for uh, uh, emergency uh, life-saving drugs. And uh, I think um, Francesco, he knows in 2012 and 13, I contacted them so many times for insulin, soluble insulin, which is a life-saving and we had none, none, and for many other drugs. And now we are suffering once again the same. Um, and health sector regarding doctors. Doctors, it is... Uh, a policy to deprive Iraq of doctors. And um, really, after it has been, uh, health system in Iraq was very good before, um, as we were one of the Commonwealth countries, and the medical school was uh, uh, of highest standard. Uh, from Saddam regime, he started assigning doctors and killing doctors because it was a personal issue. And after Saddam regime, all the intellectuals, including doctors, were encouraged to migrate, some willingly and others by threats. Uh, as they were, kidna their, they were kidnapped, they were asked for ransom, so majority of them, they have left Iraq. Level of education, uh, as, it, an, on, an, as a whole, it's been deteriorating, but medical, in particular, it's, it's very bad. It's very bad, as me medicine has become a trade. It's not a, a human service. And the uh, government have realized this. And medical schools are too many. And even they have encouraged private medical schools in the private sector investment. And that's very wrong. Because this is a government service and should not be included in bill uh, uh, Should never include, be included as a profit investing uh, schools. So this is affecting. Regarding the government, recently they have realized uh, that doctors are uh, going and they have nothing to rebuild health system. So they have extended, they have officially made the, amended the retirement age for doctors uh, specialists and they raised it to 70. That is why I'm still in service. Still government employed. Uh, because they realize that who have remained in Iraq are the recently graduated doctors and they have no one to train them. Old ones are all going and the experts are no more there. Uh, and the new generation, they really I don't know, they lack even ethics, medical ethics. <laughs> Leave other things apart. With no services, nothing to learn, nothing to, so anyone is practicing medicine, even uh, health co-workers, uh, anyone, uh, you can take drugs over the counter, any drug you want, even, even, anti-cancer therapy, you can get it over the counter, antibiotics, anything you want. And that is very dangerous, so every person in the community became a doctor. With internet, uh, the remaining few uh, think in the profession, also internet has uh, finished it, as our, the, uh, our really greatest enemy is Dr. Google, because people, 
<laughs> people, when you prescribe the medicine, they open into Google and uh, they see the, they write the symptom and uh, they get a differential diagnosis and they get the drugs that they are used and they get the side effects so they select what they will use and what they will not use uh, and the way they are used it in a very wrong way. So, um, something like that. And the uh, health uh, system is really needs to rebuild up as education system too. And uh, the other great thing, which is uh, making uh, medical schools standard law, is they have a uh, higher ministry of education, which they, uh, set, I mean, doctor, uh, medical school, is a part of higher ministry of education. But the doctors in, in the uh, medical school are work, working in health ministry. So uh, work is being um, not, uh, not, organized. not organized. And uh, so many, conflict of interest as a health doctor, uh, doctors with the health department, they are working and the burden is all on them. And the Ministry uh, of Health, of Education, they are just, they come like visitors. And uh, also they are uh, the uh, medical, the, uh, the specialist, doctors, consultant, are supposed to be advisors and specialists. And hospitals usually are nursing homes. They are treating doctors to be on call 24 hours, and they have to sit and attend to the patients, first line attending, leaving the new, uh, uh, the, the new physicians, how junior house physicians and junior uh, senior house physicians and all. They are not to attend to the patient. So there is a gap that no one is going to train them as consultants are attending first line attendance to the patients. And they are breaking the confidence between, making a gap between the community and the people and the uh, health care providers, including doctors. Also, we have uh, lots of nursing uh, personnel, workers, that are um, not well trained with low education. At time, there was a shortage. So they needed to, anyone who will get a training for one month will become a health, a nurse. And uh, now they are over, there's overcrowd, and uh, government cannot do anything with it. And uh, just it is tragedy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so apart from the general situation, maybe uh, Mustafa, you're the director of the um, Iraqi Observatory for Human Rights. Maybe you can tell us some of the challenges that you face in your work. Uh, are there things that you know that you can't do? Issues that you would like to work on, but that you think it would just be too dangerous or that it would just be impossible because you wouldn't be able to get the information. Um, what, what can you do? What can't you do? Um, why? Um, so from your, from your personal experience, as opposed to, you know, so that we can move away from the general situation, which I think we've kind of established is, is, um, is, is quite bad. يعني هناك نوع من مساحة حرية التعبير مساحة للعمل في. We have a space of freedom of expression 
We have also a space for work for the journalists working in all the areas of human rights. But on the other hand, you have to have a vision for the future. When you make an inquiry on human rights or other inquiries, you are not sure that you are going to stay alive, not even one hour, even, even in the era of freedom of expression. I'd say it's a huge chaos in Iraq. We have no criteria for the system how the, the government or the, the state functions, no criteria on communication between the human beings. These last months, or these last years, I would say the main problem of the journalists, uh, main the laws and the legislation, the political parties uh, have an influence on the institution, state institutions, uh, and they uh, make laws to prevent the freedom of expression, to prevent the right to uh, demonstrate uh, peacefully. This is against human rights. The, what is very when you dig a bit into the, the matter, you see that it's nothing about human rights. They only just pretend uh, to defend human rights. Maliki had uh, uh, done a few laws to uh, prevent the people of demonstrate peaceful, demonstrating peacefully. And also there was a new law bill that was passed uh, with some paragraphs, general paragraphs. We do not deal the issue of terrorism or the issue of uh, personal data. We have a problem of uh, the way of uh, cons uh, uh, building a human being, but also a problem in the way of building a state. The, uh, it's not the regime, it's not the state, it's not even a, 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 no, uh, an institution which works. All the different entities, state entities, are following a party, and the party has a vision or not. What prevails are the personal interests and the interests of these parties. And the main problem, the major problem, remains that these entities uh, being in power, do they have the will to put an end to this chaos? Do they have the will to create a better future so that Iraq can uh, uh, enjoy all the natural, economical, human resources? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, the present system is built on a concept of, uh, of sharing, destruction, destructing all the people who are in the different parties. They don't want any change because this change would uh, prevent them of uh, having access to these huge uh, financial uh, profits. So they don't want that the arms are in hand of the state because they don't want to take responsibility uh, on behalf of the state. They don't want that the population or the people is responsible. So they, uh, they uh, accuse the international community of being responsible of the state of this regime. We have been trying, we have been cooperating with the United Nations and the EU but all these organizations are uh, behaving as if the regime in Iraq would be acceptable. And it's a big error. And the international con community contributed to support this regime, which has, have, has been set up uh, by occupying forces. And uh, the 
say, okay, they say that the Americans are friends, that, they, that Iraq needed help, but actually they are occupiers. So, and besides all that, Iraq re remains a, a place of conflicts between the United States and Iran. It's also the place of conflict, of an economical conflict, uh, and with all the sanctions being imposed on Iran. And also, Iraq is violent, violating uh, some sanctions in order to, uh, to go uh, towards Iran, and this all this uh, uh, produces leads to many tensions uh, inside of Iraq. People are trying to live as peacefully as they can, but those who are have the power are not uh, are not uh, able to occupy to 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 to, to be in such positions uh, i am an optimist in life but i'm not optimistic uh, for the situation in iraq uh, poverty uh, is uh, huge in iraq we have th three persons uh, we have internally displaced persons we have many disabled also we have hundred and third 30,000 uh, uh, pupils who are no more at school, uh, who just left school, and each Iraqi citizen has no advantage from the state. We have a we have hundreds of thousands of dollars we owe to, uh, millions of dollars we owe to a different international institution like the World Bank. Uh, and all these external factors are very tiring for the Iraqi situation. And the only great question is, is ISIS going to come back in Iraq? And you have certain signs showing that they slowly uh, are building a new organization. Maybe it, it's going to be called uh, ISIS or something else. Uh, all these little groups uh, seem to appear uh, in the eastern part of Iraq. And the situation, present situation in Iraq is that uh, makes that uh, a lot of citizens are facing more and more challenges. Uh, and all the uh, human rights activists do not find this, the, the space to go on with their work. Um, I, I wanted to hear from Francesco, who um, um, headed the Human Rights Office for a number of years, um, what kind of uh, challenges his staff uh, found briefly. But then I wanted to move on to um, social issues. Um, I have a lot of um, friends in Iraq um, who come from mixed background. Uh, Shia married with Sunni, Sunni married with Shia. I don't see that happening um, very much um, these days. And uh, I think it's a reflection of the heightened um, sectarian conflict. Um, again, as I said earlier, it's not clear the extent to which sectarianism is at the root of the conflict or whether the conflict is feeding sectarianism. Different parties in the conflict are um, standing to benefit and are exploiting sectarian uh, differences. And, uh, and then when, in, in situation of conflict, the, the need for revenge also finds a specific form of expression in, in sectarianism. So um, it, it, uh, I'd like to hear from, from Maha and, and Mustafa on, on that specific issue, but then from Francesco also. On. Sure. 
Um, there was always lots of challenges um, working in Iraq, and um, I, you know, <laughs> there were so many manifest problems. And of course, the Human Rights Office was just a very small office of the United Nations machinery. I think we had 43 staff in all of the country, and that, of course, included uh, 20 national staff. Um, so you can imagine the type of challenges that we confronted with. I had no money. I had $100,000 a year um, to spend on human rights programming. Um, compared to, what, there was $2 billion in the trust fund at one point for the Iraqi trust fund. I want to remind everybody as well that um, Iraq is not a poor country. Um, up until June 2014, the country was earning up to $7 billion a month on oil revenues. And yet, as I said, they didn't have electricity in the capital city. There was no clean water in Basra or Thikar. The infrastructure was basically destroyed. And I think one of the signal failures of that has been the international community's failure to really understand that if you're going to rebuild a country, if you're going to address the root causes of conflict, you have to address both the political, the human rights and rule of law, and the development and access to basic services simultaneously in a coherent way. If you're doing one thing here and another thing here and you're not working in coordination, you are just doing piecemeal things. And what you end up doing, of course, is, as I said before, you address the symptoms, not the root causes. And this is one of the fundamental problems. Um, I think what we really need to do in Iraq is break this cycle of vendetta and vengeance and revenge and start to break down the walls around the fact that every community has suffered at the hands of every other by trying to build a more positive future for everybody. And this means community reconciliation, not just political reconciliation. It requires communities to sit down and start to talk to each other again and to rebuild those bridges. And for the government to have an inclusive political process where everybody is brought on board to be able to discuss what Iraq's problems are and not act like it's a triumphalist government that has the chance now to wreak revenge on whatever other members of the community had harmed them perceived to have harmed them uh, in the past. Um, you know, um, justice is a really important thing. I mean, the quality of justice is appalling in Iraq, and one of the things I wanted to mention was I used to, I used to monitor the trials, and I can tell you what an Iraqi trial consists of. It consists of a person being brought in before a judge. The judges ask you how you plead, guilty or not guilty. The person will often say they're not guilty. The judge will say, but we have a confession, and the person will say, but it was tortured out of me. And then the judge will say, well, thank you for that. And then they'll go away and consider the evidence and come back and usually pass a guilty verdict, which often ends in a death, death sentence. That's, I, I've sat in trials that last, I think, 15 minutes, and there is no uh, a, you know, a presentation of a defense or anything else. And so you know, this is the justice system that the international community presided over. Uh, over <laughs> the last 13 years. Um, so there are signal problems in terms of, 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 of what can be done, what needs to be done. And I think we're all well aware of what needs to be done. But as I say, I think Iraq has one opportunity left, and it's now. And we have to really start to break down the corruption. We have to break down this discriminatory access to services, which is given to people as largesse. We have to break down um, um, this um, um, sectarianism which has been really exploited through the past violations of human rights that have gone on for decades. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll finish this little story by telling you about a, a staff member of the UN who was kidnapped by a militia. And it gives you a signal of what a lot of Iraqis actually feel underneath. Um, he was kidnapped and it was reported to us that before he was killed, they shot him in the head. The uh, person who kidnapped him had the gun to his head and said, what are you? Are you a Sunni or a Shia? And he responded, I'm an Iraqi. And they shot him in the head. So you can see how sectarianism has been exploited and how many people really resent the fact that before when they would not associate religion with themselves in their daily lives, the situation in Iraq over the last 18 years has come to the point where people are forced to. And this has been exploited by a lot of politicians for their own power purposes. And was said earlier, one of the things here is um, trying to convince some of these politicians that they really need to address the root causes of the violence in Iraq means addressing the very sources by which they've come to power. And this is one of the signal problems, I think, that we have in terms of the way politics has, has evolved in Iraq. Uh, Maha Mustafa, maybe, Maha Mustafa, maybe a, a little bit uh, in brief about the whole sectarian issue and how do you... How do you see it? How are you confronted? Are you confronted with it uh, more so today than 20 years ago, 30 years ago? What, what can be done? 
totalitarianism and uh, it has been there throughout because before 2003, Shias were deprived of everything and uh, even Sunnis were deprived, particular uh, group that belonged to Saddam Hussein, they were enjoying all the rights and no other people. So right now, uh, really conflicts that it has been exploited by the uh, political parties for their own benefits. Our big tragedy occurred when the uh, jurisdictional system got السلطة التنفيذية سيطرت على السلطات الثلاث على السلطة التشريعية والسلطة on the judicial power, and the judicial power was uh, oppressed by the executive power. And this is what happened in uh, Iraq when we still suffer from this situation. That's why the, uh, the justice that in the hands of militias and of private persons and justice had nothing to say. Uh, every human, every person imagined that he can impose uh, right and justice uh, by himself. Well, one question was uh, sort of coming down from the political level at the interaction between communities, between, between are still individuals, going. Yes. between neighbors. Marriages are still going on between Sunnis and Shias, and people are still living together, but. Uh, political uh, parties and local governments are trying to make the South, Middle and South governorates closed for Shia community. As Diwaniya in particular, I'll tell you about Diwaniya, we used to have uh, more than uh, 500 families Sunni. Now they are 200. And they have no representation, no voice in the provisional council, nowhere. So they are trying to make it closed. And uh, Sunni community, they are not uh, trying to uh, say that we have right and we are uh, from Diwania and we have equal rights to your rights. The, he gave me a poster in which he is telling me that in uh, Hussein revolution, they were, they participated and they supported him. Can you kindly publish it for me on internet? So they are not approaching it in the right way. Regarding merits, I tell you, my, my sister-in-law, she's a Sunni, rather from Saudi Arabia. My, um, my, I mean, my the nephews and uh, nieces, many of them are married to Sunni. My sister is married to Sunni, who, who is Jordanian, so we don't have problem in that regard, and still it is going on. <laughs> Thank you. And Mustafa, on the issue of sectarianism, is it the reason for the conflict, or is the conflict making sectarianism worse? I think that uh, different religions has an impact on the conflict, and the contrary is true as, as well. This sector has created a divide uh, in the uh, Iraqi society and uh, politicians uh, at power alleged that many things were finished, but unfortunately we've seen that it's a great demographic change. You have some regions which are only for Shias and other regions only for Sunnis. I think you... All these religion issues have been used by the politicians uh, and also by ISIS. The, 
because uh, they created also this divide between uh, the Islamists and the uh, clerical. Uh, because you, you know, we know that Islamists uh, attacked uh, all what is civil. Uh, all the person, personality who wanted a civil state uh, were attacked. And we think that this also uh, uh, is something that uh, we have uh, was also in the history of the Western world because this secularity, I don't know, this the question of secularity is going to come up. I don't know when we are going to put an end to this terrible situation uh, in Iraq. We know that the situation is still difficult. And the relation amongst Iraqis is good, but sometimes it can be uh, disrupted. We don't know if we love each other or not in Iraq. We are passionate, and sometimes when you have, uh, when we are uh, frank and we are open, though the situation gets more relaxed, uh, but when you have all this issue about religion, the situation can uh, deteriorate. Also, also, the relations between Sunnis and Shias. I am Shi, Shia. My my wife is a Sunni. Uh, this is not the main thing presently. But the important thing in Iraq is to see how to put an end to this awful situation. There was uh, an opportunity for the people to organize, uh, for, for instance, a, na a neighborhood would organize itself to get support. Maybe we'll take three questions at a time, just in the interest of sort of time management. Um, I just wanted to know the reaction of the Gulf countries regarding the country because um, we seeing uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria is on his way to retake the country. We and can't uh, hear you so well. Speak in the microphone. Ah, okay. It's better like that? Okay. I just wanted to know the Gulf countries' reaction to the conflict, I mean post-conflict in Iraq, because we're seeing Bashar al-Assad on his way to retake control of his country. And then uh, um, Iran influence being bigger and bigger in Iraq. And um, so I was just wondering what was the reaction of the Gulf countries and their US allies in that because uh, this sectarian conflict is also like a geographical and uh, let's say, um, geopolitical proxy war maybe in Iraq. Thank you. One more. Do we have one more? Okay, let's take these two, uh, which are quite different. So how can people organize to solve their problem, I think that was the question, to try and take things into their own hands. And the other question on the role of Gulf countries um, taking note of Iran's increased role. Um, just on the people, you know, organizational level, um, you've got to remember that um, Iraqis lived for decades under dictatorship, and in many ways it robbed people of their sense of initiative. Not that they're not intelligent or well-educated or anything else, it's just their initiative is sometimes lacking. That's, that's one of the most important things. Um, under the debathification that happened after the Americans um, um, seized the country in 2003, um, nearly everybody uh, who was in any sort of position of importance was a member of the Ba'ath, and many of them were purged out of their jobs, irrespective of whether or not, I mean, every school teacher in the country was a member of the Ba'ath. So, I mean, you know, people who at certain levels of the bath were all thrown out of their jobs, and so they lost a whole lot of 
capacity in terms of a lot of the ministries. And, you know, Maha can tell you what happened in the Ministry of Health when they threw so many doctors out of their jobs, even though doctors often had to be members of the bar, they had no choice in it. Um, so there is this sort of organizational capacity gap that Iraq suffers from today, um, there's also, which has also fueled the, the prospects for corruption to take hold. The other side of it too is I, I get a sense sometimes from Iraq's political leaders is they don't want people to be empowered and organized because that would take power away from them. It would prevent them from twisting things like sect, like um, a tribal affiliation or religion or whatever. Um, it would take it away from them. Um, and one of the things I've always said in Iraq, Iraq had a, a really good education system back in the day. I think they had nearly 100% literacy um, in both boys and girls, and now I think it's about six, six, 60 or 70 percent. That's right. And um, now I think it's 60, 63 or 64 percent, uh, 68 percent for boys and 63 percent for girls. I mean, this is, you know, this is disastrous because what Iraq really needs um, is education. And when I've suggested to local governors, for example, maybe you could utilize the power of all these young unemployed youth to help, you know, clean up the streets, pick up the garbage, um, motivated to help their communities. These governors will just look at, I may as well have told them I was pregnant by the look that they gave me, right? Like, are you seriously suggesting we should allow young people to organize? So this sort of goes against the grain of how politics is very patriarchal, very paternalistic, very much held by middle-aged or older men who really don't like to be challenged. All I can say about that is I hope the youth of Iraq who are fantastic you know, they're full of so many fantastic ideas. Um, I hope that they will be kinder to the older generation than the older generation has been to them. Um, we haven't really brought the gender um, element much into it. Maybe, uh, Maha, you can uh, include that in your answer um, in terms of how, how people organize and uh, how women organize uh, can they and, of course, the role of the Gulf countries. Unless women take role, no peace will be there in Iraq. Because the women is the person who will uh, lead the conf ignite the conflicts and is the one who can make it subside and make peace come. So unless we target women in education, in community uh, social work, in peace work, in coexistence, uh, and reconciliation among community, no peace will be there. Okay, Men we'll alone will not do it. Men will adhere to the women. And if women is not willing, it will not be there. So we have really to target women and we will have to work on women. But on your personal experience, Maha, as, yes. a, you are, as well as being a doctor, you're also a women's rights activist. Yes. What, what's your experience? I mean, what's... Uh, uh, we know what women must do, but what kind of challenges do you find when you try and do those things with women yes. uh, on the ground? Actually, men usually, you, they, they uh, stop women from joining such uh, activities because they are getting control of women and uh, as a result, women remains the uh, submissive and negative part of the society. So I, when I re did many works, I targeted both men and women. I could not do it for women only. And I have really achieved uh, impact in many things, like in um, some traditional things, traditional um, practices uh, in Iraq now after uh, I started working in 2008, and now a legislation was passed on it, like um, forbiddenness of when a girl is uh, asked into, married, into marriage and uh, her cousin can't stop the marriage. Or when a girl wants to, when a conflict between families occur and they exchange women as a, a piece of, uh, Good, they, they, I'll marry, I'll give you my daughter or my, to stop the conflict. And I did work on uh, minorities. Uh, 
gypsies were without identity, they had no water, and they were um, excluded from uh, society. And I worked on it since 2012, and only last week, government agreed to grant them identity, national identity. Uh, so actually, in that work, I had to include both in, uh, com uh, both men and women. But usually, I select uh, men that can be um, not extreme, not extremist. That can be. They want to show that uh, oh, they are understanding and they support women's rights and and you uh, women who can take the. Uh, lead and uh, be active, uh, it is not necessarily that they are highly educated. Usually the, there are many women who are uh, housewives, but they, they, can't, they are strong women and they can't take the lead and they do the work. Uh, school, school and college girls, but um, now actually something has happened which is uh, disheartening is uh, drugs in between school girls have been widespread and that's why i'm interested to visit the green tent and i have got an appointment tomorrow to go and see that and see how can i help uh, iraqi girls through this problem thank you um, Mustafa, on the role of the Gulf countries and um, in, in the post-conflict in Iraq, can they play a positive role or are they just going to use Iraq as a battlefield to sort their problems with Iran? يعني للأسف إنه إيران تتعامل مع العراق كحديقة حلفية. Well, it's a sad thing to say, but Iran considers Iraq as its backyard. The Iranian influence is growing in Iraq uh, since 2003. The U.S. Uh, gave Iraq on a silver plate to Iran. And since then, there have been uh, many militia and armed groups flourishing in the country. Those groups do not respect uh, Iraqi law. They do not care about rebuilding the country. No hospitals are being built, even in uh, areas under Shia influence, and the conflict between uh, Gulf countries and Iran, between the Turkish and the Kurds. Iraq is a playground for all these conflicts. But beyond all of this, and uh, from the economic point of view, we have historical links with Iran. However, the only positive relations uh, that we have with Iran are of an economic nature. But of course, uh, in the present context, Iraq is also uh, used uh, within a Irani conflict between the reformist parties, al in Iran, and the extremist 
party in Iran. These, there is a major conflict and I do not believe that these uh, communities are able to change anything about it. But the international community has, uh, well, the day uh, the international community uh, agrees that Iraq needs to be a peaceful country, things might happen. We are helpless. Of course, we will uh, keep uh, doing our job, uh, but the decision is uh, essentially uh, in the hands of uh, the Western countries, Iran and the U.S. things that I thought we were seeing in 2014 was literally the unraveling of the Sykes-Picot. If many of you know what the Sykes-Picot was, it was the agreement between the French and the English which basically drew the borders up in the Middle East at the end of World War I. And what I thought was happening was that all of this artificiality is now unraveling before us. And I think there are deeper historical issues here that have never, ever really been addressed. And really, the defeat of the Daesh is, is, and the ending of the war in Syria is really just pushing all this back under the carpet again. But it's still there, and it hasn't gone away. And we have to remember that there's, uh, you know, there's been a three-way tango going on in the Middle East between old cultural spheres of influence or old empires when I used to talk to the Iranians, they used to tell me that one of their objectives was they needed to stop the Ottomans, literally, quote, Ottomans, from re-establishing themselves in the Middle East. And when I talked to the Turks, they would say, we have to stop the Safavids, meaning the Persians, or Iranians, um, from doing the same. And then, of course, you had Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries with their particular interests as well. And set that against the bigger global scheme of international powers, I mean, <laughs> it's quite a mess. But I think there's a really deep-seated historical series of issues going on, and I think there is a bit of an identity crisis generally in the Middle East. But this is something that really the people in the Middle East themselves are going to have to work out if they're allowed to. Whether or not they'll be allowed to is one of the questions I think you know, remain to be answered. Um, I think we're um, coming to an end of our time. I see the clock uh, come to zero. Are there any more questions that we can take briefly? If not, or, oh yes, there is one here. Bonjour. Bonsoir. Uh, just une petite Good evening. Um, uh, I have a question. After World War II, European countries uh, benefited from the Marshall Plan to rebuild uh, their economies. I was wondering if uh, such a thing is uh, and possible for Iraq, maybe, with the Arab League or the Islamic States, I don't know, uh, to organize uh, some kind of a regional help, maybe. Uh -huh. A Marshall Plan for, uh, for Iraq. Um, I mean, I, I think that we should be quite clear that the coalition, because obviously the destruction in Iraq hasn't really come from the Islamic countries. It's come from, um, from the bombs that our countries produce and that the forces of our countries have, uh, have dropped um, on Iraq to a large extent. Um, but in, in those countries that have so much contributed to the destruction of Iraq have made it quite clear that, and it's the same for Syria, these are countries that are considered as middle-income countries. So the open position has been there is going to be some, some help for, uh, for infrastructure, but not for rebuilding. Um, but... Uh, no, that's um, generally the uh, attitude I got a lot of was whenever you'd hear this word Marshall Plan, we need a Marshall Plan in Iraq and that, the reaction of most donor states was, well, no, Iraq was, as I say, earning five to seven billion dollars a month on oil revenue. It's a middle income country. It doesn't need that sort of assistance. It needs technical assistance and expertise and dealing with corruption and all a range of things. But the destruction in Iraq is widespread. I mean, it's not just Mosul we saw in the film. Go to Ramadi or Fallujah or to Crete. I mean, <laughs> 
these places have been devastated. Not only that, but the places that were deprived and devastated for decades under Saddam, etc. So you've got a lot of areas in the country which needs significant investment and significant rebuilding just to ensure basic services so that people can have a future, they can have economic viability. Um, and these are some of the critical issues that I think need to be, need to be addressed. Um, any more questions? If not, um, it only remains for me to thank the panel, Maha and uh, Mustafa and Francesco and uh, Abureda for the translation. And thank you all for, for coming. Thank you.